Hello, Blogging Heads Nation. I am Bill Butler, and if I am here, then we're probably talking tech in some form or another. Uh, this time, we're going back to a topic from last year, uh, and uh, that is going to be the state of Wikipedia. And so I'm doing so with a return guest. Uh, Andrew, thanks for joining us. Would you care to remind viewers uh, who you are and what you do? Good to be with you. My name is Andrew Lee. I'm a professor of journalism at American University here in Washington, D.C., and I have a book called The Wikipedia Revolution, How a Bunch of Nobodies Created the World's Greatest Encyclopedia. And I've been studying Wikipedia since 2003, where I'm also an administrator and kind of a cultural historian, I suppose. Uh, and uh, looking forward to the conversation about where Wikipedia is today and where it's going. Right on. Uh, Long-time viewers probably know that I also am a Wikipedia editor. Not as long as you, but since 2006. And I write a blog called The Wikipedian. And uh, I will also, towards the end of this discussion, we'll get to uh, some of the ways in which Wikipedia is also a professional focus for me as well. Um, but before that, we have, you know, not quite a year's worth of Wikipedia development history to address. And, you know, if there's going to be an overall overarching theme to it, I think to some extent it's this sense that, I don't know, things are not entirely going well. Over time, there have been these criticisms, including the fact that Wikipedia has this very stark gender imbalance in terms of its editor participation. Also, that the number of editors who are participating has been steadily declining over the past five years, even longer than that. And while Wikipedia tends to be, oh, look, it's, it's as big as it ever was. It's the, still the, the fifth most visited website in the world. You and I just got back from the Wikimania conference in London. I don't know how many years it's been going now, but it was certainly a large event and seemed like people were really, uh, you know, uh, Wikipedia has a strong following and that doesn't seem like the problem. But there definitely are. The, all is not well in, in Denmark. Um, so you and I were talking about this before and you had this interesting analogy. First of all, before you get to the analogy, would you care to share some of your views on what people are saying about, you know, the, the, the problems that Wikipedia has at this uh, point in time? Yeah, so this was an interesting conference because, you know, Wikipedia started in 2001. It is 2014. Wikipedia has just entered its teenage years, technically. And it's more than just technically. It's actually probably symbolically uh, this year has seen the breakout of some very interesting clashes in the community and probably indicative of anything that enters into its kind of second decade of existence. Uh, it was also 10 years of Wikimania, which is the annual conference of Wikipedia editors, and it started in Germany in 2005, and this was the 10th meeting, or kind of a global, I don't even want to say Congress, but kind of a user community meeting of folks in London, which is pretty significant given that this was the largest assembly of Wikipedians ever at about 1800 to 2000. So that's pretty, pretty big. Um, mm -hmm. but, but I think the, the whole teenage years analogy that I try to make is, is significant because uh, there was a significant... Uh, clash this year, or probably at the last day of the conference, just by coincidence, between what we mm -hmm. generally call the community and the Wikimedia Foundation, which is the nonprofit with a board and with the budget to oversee the projects. And this has been something that's been gathering steam or gathering uh, you know, tension over many, many years, but it finally came to a head when the foundation, which has a significant engineering and programming and technical staff, decided to launch certain technical features on the German Wikipedia uh, to the consternation of, I don't even want to say the majority, but let's say the vocal German editors, uh, to mm -hmm. the point where there was kind of a technical tussle and technical fight over whether this feature should be on or off. And in the end, the Wikimedia Foundation bigfooted some engineering changes on the w German Wikipedia mm -hmm. community by pretty much overruling the main community leaders in German Wikipedia. And that's really quite unprecedented mm -hmm. to have such a public spat. And it really has come to a head in September, October of 2014, to the point where people are questioning right. what the long-term relationship is going to be between the volunteers that have certainly delivered Wikipedia to be the success that it is, and the foundation, which has the donation dollars and the board of trustees to oversee the project. This is something that has always been tense, but now it is, I don't want to quite say it, a war, but it is an, an open battle. Yeah, I, I might only disagree to say that it's not 
entirely unprecedented because I think the last time that you and I were on Blogging Heads talking Wikipedia back in, I believe it was October of last year, that was not too long following the fight over the visual editor. Right. And the visual editor was a software feature also developed by uh, programmers at the Wikimedia Foundation, the professional part of the Wikipedia community, the one that doesn't is not responsible for the article content that you know readers read. Um, and you know the visual editor was supposed to make it easier for people who did not want to get involved in the HTML like markup language behind Wikipedia pages. It was supposed to make it easier. And while it certainly wasn't perfect, uh, it at least did that in, 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 in most use cases, many use cases. But it really did not make the, you know, the folks that have been around for years and years, the folks who do like to work with the markup language that works every time. And so in terms of big, big footing, what happened last year was uh, the user community essentially big footed the Wikimedia Foundation and turned off the visual editor for the default usage. So right. you can still turn it on if you want to. And I think you do use it, if I'm not mistaken. Um, right. But, you know, the average, the, the person who just signs on would not know that it's there. And this time around, it was the, the shoe was on the other foot. The, the, the big shoe was on the other big foot. <laughs> um, so to just right. make up, it just start right. twisting analogies as badly as I can. Right. Here. So those um, clashes have existed what, before. But... Yeah. By the way, would you also, uh, what was the, this is the media viewer. Could you explain for viewers what the... Uh, what the actual, what were they disagreeing about? What was the software? Right, I mean, probably to me this is the most distressing, which is that the feature that they battled over is called the media viewer, which is what happens when you click on a picture in Wikipedia. Now, mm -hmm. I would just, you know, being a veteran of Wikipedia and just kind of back in the napkin guess that the number of visitors who actually click on an image to see the details and the uh, caption and the who uploaded it and what's the licensing information. The number of people who visit Wikipedia and actually click on an image to find out details is probably in the single digit percentages, if not sub 1% uh, of visitors who do that. Right. So for this to right. be an outright civil war in Wikipedia over this particular issue is particularly troubling to me. Um, whereas mm -hmm. the visual editor, you could argue that when, you know, the people who hit the edit button in Wikipedia is actually not a huge number either, but you can imagine the number of people who mm -hmm. want to try to edit Wikipedia is fairly significant, and the experience that they have when they click on it, whether it looks like Microsoft Word or whether it looks like computer programming, you know, is a big deal. Mm -hmm. right. For this one, which is when you click, if you happen to click on the picture, whether it shows you detailed information or not so detailed information about the picture, to me, is you know, it's it's not worth killing yourself over. But unfortunately, I think it is <laughs> worth it to kill folks over for this particular conflict yeah. that we have in 2014. So you're right in that it's not unprecedented to have these conflicts. To me, it was unprecedented mm -hmm. to have the Wikimedia Foundation look at the community. I don't even want to say consensus. That's what the community says it is, but we're not even mm -hmm. sure whether it's, it is consensus. But let's say the, the vocal voices right. and overrule them and say, you know what, community, you have a point. But no, we know better. We got to push this feature forward. That's what's unprecedented, and yeah. we're kind of in uncharted territory at this point. Yeah, I mean, this has been. I, I do feel like this has been developing for a while. With the visual editor being the first time, at least I saw this really manifest itself in a in a public fight. Uh, not the sort of public fight that people off of Wikipedia would know about, but for those of us who spend time in the back pages and discussion sections of Wikipedia, you know, this has definitely been this growing issue where. I mean, this is one of the fundamental contradictions about Wikipedia, about how it should not work in theory, but it works in practice. Some of the practice is breaking down a little bit that you have. And so for those of you at home who only experience Wikipedia as a you know, set of pages you go to when you want to find some back of the envelope information, you know, be aware that all the material that you see in Wikipedia is created by this very broad group of several thousand Wikipedia editors, many thousands over the years who have tried, they're all volunteers. They just edit a little bit as much as they want to. Um, and they, they are essentially, they are unpaid. Um, and then you have this, but someone's got to keep the lights on. And so the Wikimedia Foundation, that's the nonprofit in San Francisco. They're the ones who 
are hitting you up for our donations every uh, every like quarter, every every yeah. fall, every winter. Um, and they've done this so quite successfully. They have uh, quite a big amount, quite a big bankroll. Uh, maybe not bankroll, but they have um, what's the word I'm looking for? Endowment uh, fund. Well, it's not they an endowment, but but they, they they right. They basically have no, a big right. purse every fundraising sec- section, and That's even that purse. You know, the question of who gets that money. And who gets dispersed that money yes. has been a long-running battle in terms of, you know, who donates to Wikipedia right. from Germany, from Austria, from U.S., from France. Um, mm-hmm. Sometimes it's easy to map who donated to what language group should get it. But let's say, like, Brazil mm-hmm. speaks Portuguese. Portugal speaks Portuguese. When you donate through the Portuguese Wikipedia, who gets that money? You know, so there's a lot of weird things when money right. comes into play, right? Yeah, I mean, think of any any problem you have with an NGO or nonprofit, um, and you know, uh, the more that I learn about nonprofits and NGOs, the the more the worse they seem to be run. And you know, I don't mean to impugn anybody in particular at at uh, the Wikimedia Foundation. I think that they have a really difficult task. The way you just identified there, where does that Portuguese money go? To which which you know country organization? That's that's really tough. Uh, speaking of Wikimania, uh, uh, somebody who is, uh, that we both know in common, um, actually a couple of people that we know, you know, are people who are longtime contributors to the Wikipedia community, and they were not able to get scholarships to travel to the Wikimania conference this year. Uh, and the, instead, these scholarships went to people from, uh, you know, I think, uh, say the developing world where Wikipedia would like to get more contributors, uh, but here you have some people who are really dedicated contributors and would have a lot to bring to that conference. They were essentially disinvited because they are people who work on their students and you know live on nonprofit salaries. They're not right. able to make this trip to this global country. And I mean, who know, I, I certainly do not want to discount Wikimedia's goal to get more people from you know other countries to get involved. There are a lot of people from North America and Europe involved in Wikipedia. But how about support the people who are really already having an impact? I think right. There's, right. there's an example of that kind of issue. Yeah, and there's I, I, so many types of issues like that. Right. I think in general, the Wikimedia Foundation has done a good job of going out of its way to make sure this is not just first worldpedia and that it is inclusive of emerging economies right. and, and language groups that don't have the big footprint like English or French or Spanish. But then there are some things that are kind of out of whack. And the uh, example that you gave, which is part of a you know decade long uh i think intentional bias against um american domination of wikipedia which i completely understand and actually support in most cases Mm -hmm. but we've reached kind of a ludicrous state where right now if you look at the scholarships given to go to wikimania you know over 50 percent of the donations to wikipedia are from you know americans and north american folks but then if you look at the scholarship Mm -hmm. money only 10 percent of the scholarship money to send folks who um, apply to get money to go to Wikimania are going given to North America, which means that only a fraction of that 10% or less than 10% are given to Americans. Mm-hmm. So if Americans are given 50% or more, and then only you know a fraction of the 10% are given the scholarships, we need to rebalance that equation right. somehow. I don't think we should say, oh, you know, Americans gave 60%, 60% should go to Americans. But I think mm-hmm. that we need to rebalance that somehow. And I think um, mm-hmm. for a healthy community, um, we need to look more at trying to make sure that we don't have those imbalances. Right. Um, I mean, to take it back to the community, the, the volunteer community and professional organization that split, you know, which is becoming more of a rift than just there being two halves. I don't think, you know, a part of the problem is that the foundation itself uh, stays out of, you know, editorial matters but then is so heavily involved in general site governance. So these, these software issues, that's, that's what they do. But when they can't be involved in both, I feel like there's just going to be this split. And it's very hard. So the other thing here is while the Wikimedia Foundation has a, you know, has a, has a structure, it has a, has a hierarchy, there's someone in charge there. Over on the community side, where the editorial you know, perspective, uh, where the editorial content comes from, there, there is no leader. Um, right. It's impossible to figure out, you know, nothing ever is set in stone, and that's one of the virtues of Wikipedia, but one of the drawbacks is no one's in charge. So if the foundation is supposed to follow the community, 
but the community can't take itself in a particular direction, what happens then? Right. I mean, and this gets onto my big question to everyone who looks into this space or he just monitors online culture is can you name mm -hmm. a healthy online community that existed 15 years ago that still exists today? It's very, right. very hard to name one, right? So whether you're talking about the original well, um, you know, mm -hmm. the, the online access uh, BBS type uh, communities or Usenet or, you know, there are not good cases out there that say that this is a sustainable thing to have a community enter in it, into its teenage years and to emerge intact uh, a few years later. So we are in, uh, you know, parts unknown at this point, whether Wikipedia will survive another 15 years or whether uh, we have the right signals to adjust the community to, to make it through those years. Um, my gut feeling is that we will have a decent community, but the, but the deck is stacked against us in many ways as Wikipedia editors, mm -hmm. because unlike... You know, there, there's been some research papers comparing, oh, what does Wikipedia's productivity look like compared to, let's say, GitHub, you know, where software is contributed, or Flickr, where people can upload photos, or YouTube, mm -hmm. where you can upload videos. The, the, the problem with that comparison is that the task for Wikipedia going forward is much harder than those other communities where you just encourage more and more production, right? Upload more photos, upload more videos, contribute more code. There's no reason why someone who wrote you know, five or six versions of a sorting algorithm doesn't prevent the seventh, eighth, or ninth con contributor. Whereas in Wikipedia, it absolutely does, right? We had zero articles in 20 2001. We had a million articles a few years later. We have 4.5 million today. It is, in fact, harder to contribute that next article to Wikipedia. We don't want as many contribu contributors to make articles today as they did in 2005 in its heyday of article creation. So there is this kind of artificial, I wouldn't say artificial, a natural... Uh, suppression of contribution activity because we demand that what you contribute to Wikipedia has to fit and to be integrated into the whole of what we have as articles today. Whereas with Flickr and YouTube, it's just, yeah, upload that next cat video. Upload your vacation photos. Who cares if it's the same as the other 10,000 photos of the Sphinx or the pyramids of Egypt? That's fine. But Wikipedia, we want you to not contribute if it's redundant. We want you to not contribute if it goes against what someone else wrote. Um, that isn't factually supported. So that's a real challenge for how does this community grow when we say we got four and a half million articles, the next four and a half million articles are not that easy to write. They need deep knowledge. They need cooperation with experts. They need to access sources that are not easily findable online. That's really tough facing the next, you know, the next generation mm -hmm. of Wikipedia contributors. And that's why I've been trying to work more with museums and libraries and galleries, the whole what we call glam movement the galleries, libraries, archives, museums to say, hey, you know, a lot of the low-hanging fruit has been plucked. We need your help as curators and experts in these content areas to contribute. And we've been pretty successful here in Washington, D.C. to get the Smithsonian National Archives and folks to, to be part of that group. But we need to grow that crew much faster than it is now because if you just depend on organic um, contributors to Wikipedia, over the last five to six years, we've seen that that's not been sustainable. Right. I mean, it's simply a matter of, I, I used to be more of a rose-colored optimist about, <laughs> you know, well, we don't know how many, we don't know what the right number of Wikipedia editors is. This is something I would say maybe about four years ago. Over time, however, as it became clear that many articles that were created at one time had essentially become, maybe abandoned is too far to put it, but I was looking at a, an article just this morning and uh, it's a subsidiary of a major tech company, and it had been edited nine times in the calendar, calendar year 2014. So it was like very much out of date. And when you have four and a half million articles in the English language, but you only have a few thousand individuals across the globe who are contributing on a regular basis, mm -hmm. uh, it simply is the case that Wikipedia has too many, has, has not enough editors for the number of articles that it does have. And on YouTube, I, to go back to your point about how YouTube or GitHub, man, the contributor model there is entirely different. Yeah, upload more videos. Yeah, there's a lot of crap videos on YouTube, that's for sure, but no one's going to stop you from posting them unless they actually violate, you know, some sort of real rule, like, like actual copyright law. But on Wikipedia, besides copyright law, which certainly does apply, you also have the issue of, um, as you said, redundancy, if someone's already written it. Um, 
I, I'm going to fail to apply the old libertarian uh, conversation point about positive liberty and negative liberty. <laughs> but, you know, the idea that your, your freedom ends, your freedom to swing your fist ends at my nose. Right. At Wikipedia, it's all fists and noses. <laughs> and over at YouTube, I mean, over at YouTube, unless I'm ripping someone off or, uh, you know, posting obscene material, no one's going to stop me. My, I, I can swing my fist as far as I want and probably won't hit anybody because I'll get, you know, 30 views while right. everybody's off watching. We, we kind of need a re redefinition or clarification of Wikipedia's uh, motto, right? It's, the motto is the sum of all human knowledge. And I would right. say a more accurate description, it's the integrated sum of all human knowledge versus the big unfiltered steaming pile of human knowledge, right? <laughs> so, they, so basically, right. Flick, Flickr, YouTube, and other flakes are the, ah, just pile it on, you know, some of human stuff. Right. And Wikipedia has to be, you know, correlated, integrated, um, incorporated, rationalized, and, uh, you know, boiled down to just one article. Right. I was just talking to someone the other day. Mm -hmm. It's like, how many articles about Israel-Palestine conflicts do you have in Wikipedia? It was just one. Like, you can't make 500 versions, like Jeff's version, Mike's version, Ted's version. It has to be all right. in one place, and you need to scrum, push, punch, kick, uh, and have this agonistic relationship with other editors to come up with one version you can all agree on. That's the benefit of Wikipedia, but it's also the challenge of how do you keep that going going forward. As you said, if you mm -hmm. depend on that agonistic um, push and pull to create Wikipedia content going forward, um, that is something that we are, uh, we don't have a good experience with going past 15 years of trying to create that, right? My only real mm -hmm. site that I can point to as a site that still astonishes me that has good signal uh, to noise is something like Slashdot. Right, so Slashdot.org mm -hmm. as a tech site still has very good comment sections and comment boards. In fact, most people say that's 80% of the content on Slashdot is not the article, it's the conversation that happens afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, but that is, you know, kind of uncapped as well, you know, just like Flickr and YouTube. It doesn't, right. you don't need to rationalize and correlate um, different conversation together. You can speak your piece and people vote you up and down. So it's very hard to look at any other examples on the net that are quite like Wikipedia in terms of having a community rallying around the type of content that you have where um, there can only be one version of anything and you need to kind of push and pull over that. Yeah, I mean, you're right. Discussion forums have their own type of challenges. Wikipedia, I think, does have more. And boy, if, if discussion forums have a difficult time staying active and staying positive and, you know, uh, having people, you know, flee at some point, which happens, which happens to almost everyone, it makes me wonder if your analogy about Wikipedia entering its teenage years is quite the right one. Because um, I guess the question is, do we measure Wikipedia's lifetime in people years or in dog years? So if it's in people years, then great. It's a, it's a teenage community. Of course, we're having some struggles. The, you know, let's say, are, are the kid, you know, if the community, gosh, I don't know if the community or the foundation or the, the kids or the parents, I, there's obviously the analogy totally doesn't work there. I mean, in that, in that way, although it is tempting to think of the community as the kids since they're the ones who, you know, get mad when the, the foundation does something they don't like. Right. Moving past that. Um, if it's dog years, though, uh, then... Well, your point about how there are just not very many or really any healthy communities that have been around since the, I guess, the early days of the Internet. I mean, Slashdot certainly goes back, dates back to the 1990s. It's also very niche, too. I, I don't know what its readership is like. I have to think that a lot of the people who were on Slashdot back in the late 1990s moved to Dig in the middle of the 2000s and are currently on Reddit here in the <laughs> 2010s. Right, right. So... Like, I think there's a really scary question to be asked here about whether online communities simply have a shelf life. And what does that mean when Wikipedia is, and we should get more positive here, we were a little being a little critical, of course, when Wikipedia is one of the most important resources uh, in the world. When, you know, the new version of uh, the Mac OS operating system, which uh, I've got in beta on a laptop, you know, you want to go up and you want to start searching for something in, in Spotlight, um, it'll return Wikipedia for you very quickly. It's one of the first things that 
that you know Apple wants to show you. Mm -hmm. Siri, of course, also depends very heavily on Wikipedia, as does Google. Uh, if you ever search Google for a topic a lot of people search for, Google has now set up a little sidebar that people are familiar with. It's called a knowledge graph. It looks kind of like an info box on a Wikipedia page. Sometimes Wikipedia is the source for that information, not always. Right. So I get worried if we all depend on Wikipedia, what if it, what if these blow ups, you know, really, really go badly? Or what if something goes badly right. and, you know, the excellent what where we're losing contributors at a steady rate, what if that accelerates? Right. And I think we might have talked about this in the last time we were on the blogging heads where Mm -hmm. You know, the foundation, we've been playing this kind of interesting parlor game, like, is there a black swan event for Wikipedia going forward? It's hard to imagine right. any any other entity taking Wikipedia's place, whether it's Britannica or anything else. But mm -hmm. in terms of Wikipedia's health and growth, um, I think we might be seeing a combination of weak effects being that black swan. And part of it is what you identified and what I first saw when the proprietor of WikiHow, which is you know a, a how-to site inspired by Wikipedia, first brought this to my attention. When I was visiting their offices and I was giving a, a quick talk to them, they said, you know, here's some interesting stats to look at. Ever since Google Knowledge Graph came around, which is Google's uh, project name for skimming and scraping all this information off the net and trying to give you the answer on that first page of the search engine's results page, rather than having you click onto a link saying, hey, don't even bother clicking. I'm going to give you the answer right here. And Google, to their credit, does a great job. Um, and it's not even in violation of anything that Wikipedia does. Wikipedia says, here's our content. It's under a free license. Scrape it. Do what you want. That's the beauty of you know, Creative Commons content. Um, but the side effect of getting that answer in the first page of, of Google results and not having to click on Wikipedia is that those people who benefit from Wikipedia's content never ever see the, hey, this is encyclopedia, you can edit. Here's the edit button, please contribute. They never see that. They benefit from the content, but they never see that edit button. The other part of the weak effect that I think is, is something that we really need to keep an eye on, not just for Wikipedia, but for all of internet content, is um, at Wikimania during the hacking days, there was the report that we've seen for a while now that 33% of all accesses to Wikipedia are from mobile devices today. That's a pretty big mm -hmm. jump from even five years ago. But the projection out to 2025 is that probably 50% of accesses to Wikipedia will be from mobile devices. And if you look at the trend charts, whether it's from a tablet or from a phablet or from a mobile phone, um, an iPhone 6 and stuff like this is going to be even more um, interesting as to whether people's first and maybe only device to access the internet is a mobile device. Um, we're going to have even fewer people who are inclined to edit Wikipedia, even if they're landing on Wikipedia, no one really wants to edit Wikipedia from a mobile device, right? <laughs> We're even having no. problem with people editing from a laptop where you have a full keyboard, and to do the wiki markup that you need to edit Wikipedia with, you need funny characters like braces and brackets and uh, funny punctuation. No one wants to type that stuff on a virtual keyboard, on a tablet or a mobile phone. So you're going to see a huge problem with you know, going forward, people accessing Wikipedia on a mobile saying, oh, hey, this is great, I can benefit from the pictures and the text, but editing? No thanks, I don't even want to think about editing on a mobile phone. So if you look at that, right. fewer people coming through the front door of Wikipedia getting the edit, um, the edit uh, request or the edit um, uh, message, then second of all, even if you do know how to edit Wikipedia, I don't even want to edit Wikipedia on a mobile and they're going to make up 50% of our users. So we might see, right. just from those two facts alone, uh, fewer people you know, being available as the pool of folks that we can convince to edit Wikipedia. And that's something that we need to really keep an eye on. Certainly. Um, one other positive thing is, and we talked about this beforehand, is, so okay, if we have trouble on the editorial side, you know, the organization of information actually is, is is getting better, I think. I'm, I'm speaking of a project called Wikidata, mm -hmm. and that's been around for a couple of years now. And uh, how would you how would you describe Wikidata? Because I always struggle to try to explain it to people. <laughs> right. So the the best way to describe Wikidata, I think, is to kind of think about how content was done on Wikipedia in the early days. And when I wrote in my book, one of the great things I said about Wikipedia was that it was not demanding of you technically. You went to Wikipedia in 2001, 2002, it was a blank page. You hit edit and you said, oh, 
this is kind of cool. There's nothing here on Mark McGuire, the baseball player. I'm going to go in here and say Mark McGuire is an American baseball player, and he had a batting average of, you know, 313 in this year, and this is great. I can contribute. So, you know, those numbers and things are added, and longitude and latitude are added to the French version, the English version, German version. And then over time, I think this is the natural and right thing to do, is to say that, you know, there is data that is just common across all Wikipedia. You know, batting averages, the you know, playoff schedules for football teams, the uh, temperatures of, you know, the annual temperatures of the Maldives and things like this. So why not just put all that data into what we call structured data, meaning it's more like a spreadsheet or a database, so that you don't need human hands to type in 313 in English and 313 in French and 313 in Spanish. You make this central repository for the data, like, almost like a baseball card for Mark McGuire, or the historical temperatures of the Maldives, and then suddenly you just put in one little line of code, and suddenly the French article on Maldives is populated with this wonderful data about the historical temperatures there, or English Wikipedia, or Spanish Wikipedia. So this is where we've come to with the whole Wikidata process. It's not data as things you've typed into the page, but actually structured data held in a database, and through one little incantation, when you're editing the article, you pull in all that data from Wikidata and it just magically pops in with the right uh, language translations and suddenly you have, in any language, the these nice numerical charts and graphs and things like that. So that's great from a, um, from a standpoint of people creating content. On the other hand, it's really hard to penetrate. So, you know, I have a computer science degree. Mm -hmm. I used to do database programming. For me, I know, and I haven't learned this yet, it's going to take me probably a few hours to just pick up what the norms are in Wikidata and how to use it. That's quite intimidating. Mm -hmm. As someone who's kind of technically inclined, I can't even imagine what this looks like for the outsider, where when you click on the Wikidata page in the Wikidata project, it just looks like database gobbledygook. Um, so again, the double-edged sword of the fact that we have this cool structured data convention now in Wikipedia to help spread the data to many places very quickly, but the expertise you need to engage in that process of how do you enter in you know, the statistics on this cricket match that happened yesterday, you now need a pretty good expert to do that. It's no longer your average Wikipedia editor. And that's another thing I worry about mm -hmm. is that, so they're not coming in on a mobile, we've convinced people to hit the edit button, but now they're staring at a wall of numbers and they need to learn how to edit Wikidata. They hit cancel and go away and abandon the edit. And that's mm -hmm. another part of this uh, problem of getting editors to engage in Wikipedia. Yeah, I mean, look, it's, it's just only natural that over time, Wikipedia, like other systems, becomes more complex. Right. And, you know, I, I went to one of the sessions that I saw at Wikimania was this uh, a video game designer named uh, Raf Koster. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. And... Uh, he's largely responsible for the uh, online uh, MMO version of Ultima, I believe. And he had a terrific talk. It is available on the web at his website. And one of his ideas was, what if you have, like, just, you know, kind of Wikipedia forest fires and just clear out a whole bunch of articles and have them rewritten again? And I, the community I would never go for this in any form that I could ever picture. But if you wanted to have actual... Regenerative, regenerative growth, you would need something just like that. And there is a fundamental conservatism to Wikipedia where we have, here's what we have, it's our resource, we protect it, we're going to cultivate it, don't make any sudden changes. And, you know, I, I do, um, I, in my, in my, in my uh, professional life, I do uh, work with clients who want to get changes made on Wikipedia. And it can be, there can be a great inertia around pages where I'll show up, make a conversation, or I'll make, make a suggestion in conversation to an editor, and they'll be like, I don't know, that's a really big change. Like, slow down, slow down. And the page may be terrible, but right. it can be difficult to articulate. This whole page is just bad. It just should go. But, you know, there's, there's a reluctance to second-guess the accumulated wisdom of many editors over time even if it's not really all that wise. Yeah, I think it's time to revisit some tech books of the past. I mean, one of the things that we do when we see books that are printed, you know, about technology or the internet mm -hmm. is that they get stale very quickly and we, we kind of never go back to revisit them. One I think we do need to revisit right. that I, I remember quite fondly is the book by Alan Cooper called The Inmates Are Running the Asylum, 
why high-tech products drive us crazy and how to restore the sanity. And I really never thought about this exactly until you, we had this conversation, but this is a perfect book for Wikipedians because it basically is this push of the power users of Wikipedia driving or trying to drive the narrative on how features and the user experience um, of Wikipedia um, is projected to the public, right? So I think that perfectly encapsulates what has happened in the last year, which is that the so-called referenda in the community are all super power users and veterans and um, want to have all the bells and whistles. And when they see that there are things that make the interface simpler or more beautiful or um, are imperfect attempts to try to give visual editing capabilities, they think it's the end of the universe and they want it back the way that it used to be. So the, the great thing about the uh, description of this book, you know, this was originally meant for um, the book here, you know, which kind of predates Wikipedia's heyday, was to reconsider how like digital cameras, phones, cars, you know, are not really usable by the general public and that it's engineers who think that double clicking on something or holding down two buttons simultaneously are reasonable user interface features when they're actually only decipherable by uh, other computer types or technical types. So this one, the description here says, think about your phone, camera, cars, everything being automated and programmed by people who in their rush to accept the many benefits of these technologies have abdicated their responsibility to make these products easy to use. And I think that's pretty good encapsulation of a lot of what's going on um, as attention. And the Wikimedia Foundation has a responsibility to try to look at things from the reader's standpoint, the voiceless readers, right? The people who kind of run to Wikipedia's content and might look at it and go, eh, I don't know what to do, and then leave. They never leave feedback. It's hard to reach these people to figure out what frustrated them. And the Wikimedia Foundation has tried to do user testing to run these studies. But these type of activities get very little respect by the power users of Wikipedia who do these internal mm -hmm. Uh, community discussions. And I think that's the long-term problem that I don't see a real solution for anytime soon. There needs to be kind of a coming together to say that, hey, you know what, we need, do need to look at the whole experience for, for outsiders. But you know, you have a lot of folks in Wikipedia who are power users that are not that interested in looking at the experience of outsiders, unfortunately. That's well said. Um, one last thing here before we go. Um, the uh, we, you know, we have, uh, we've buried the lead. Andrew, you and I gave a presentation at Wikimania, right. uh, this summer. And, uh, I've already alluded a couple times here to the, you know, the, the consulting work that I do on, on Wikipedia. I've done this since about 2008. Um, but it's a thing that I have not really talked a whole lot about in public over time. I think I've always done a good job of it and I've always intended to do so in a way that is good for the Wikipedia community that is helping, say, outside companies figure out how to get better coverage on Wikipedia. Um, but it's always this sort of thing, I remember, I, who can forget, Wikipedia is a volunteer resource. And so yet yeah, I do, you know, I do work in a professional capacity with companies. And so that's been a really interesting, you know, needle to thread over the last few years. But as the conversation has evolved on Wikipedia about this topic, we've already discussed how so many pages are out of date. A lot of those pages are also company pages. So at the same time, you've had a large number of individuals and even whole companies that are set up trying to just go in and make changes on Wikipedia on the sly. It is this big, big topic on Wikipedia. It really has been for a number of years. And I am happy to say, I think I'm happy to say that over the last couple of years, the conversation has come out into the into the you know public view more. Unfortunately, that's largely been driven by uh, some scandals where some of these companies got caught, you know, trying to fiddle with uh, articles or even do much more than that than fiddle. And so, you know, there's the, the presentation is part of a whole project that um, uh, I started late last year, and you've been involved with uh, through um, you know through to this point. And here I'm just monologuing. Um, anything you would like to, how, how would you, so Andrew, you are somebody who has been involved in Wikipedia for a long time. You do not offer consulting services at all. You are, hey, you've, you've, you've benefited in terms of writing a book and certainly becoming someone who goes on TV to talk about Wikipedia on occasion. But this was a really a new topic to you or one you hadn't been involved with, I think, until we started talking about it a year ago. Mm -hmm. I think I'm correct on that. How, how did you approach this topic when, 
The topic, of course, being paid editing of Wikipedia, right. um, conflict of interest, and how businesses should or should not get involved. How did you approach this when you first, when it first got on your radar? Right. Well, I mean, first thing to do is for folks who are really interested in this topic, and I encourage you, if you are, to look at the video of our session at Wikimania. So it's on YouTube, it's on Vimeo. If you just look for Wikimania 2015, I'm sorry, 2014, paid editing Wikipedia, right. I'm pretty sure you'll find it fair, fairly quickly. Yeah. And it's a great introduction. It's kind of like an act in three parts where I talk a little bit about the history of PR and Wikipedia and kind of how we got here. Bill talks about kind of what has happened recently, which I'll kind of give my quick reactions to here. And then the third part, which I think is the most interesting, is kind of the, the, the unknown part of the universe where, you know what, outside of English Wikipedia, there are a lot of editions of Wikipedia that not only allow paid editors to edit, but they encourage editors to edit. Not only editors to edit, but actually corporate representatives, the PR people of companies, to edit articles about the company they work for, which I think is quite astonishing to especially English Wikipedians, yeah. where we've had a very, you know, no, 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 no policy about that kind of stuff, versus smaller languages mm -hmm. where they say, you know what, we only have three million speakers of our language. If we don't allow the PR people to edit, who's going to edit this article? So yes. Um, so that's really interesting to see that session at Wikimania because I think we really deeply explore that. So we can only talk very briefly about it here. But m the reason why I thought this topic was so interesting to get engaged with is, you know, I'm a journalism professor. Journalists inherently have a mistrust of the PR profession. And we always have this antagonistic or um, tense relationship with PR folks. Um, and what has happened over the years is there was always this kind of cold war in English Wikipedia, at least, because... English mm -hmm. Wikipedia basically says, no, 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 you should not do that. And PR folks, um, and they, even that's a terrible thing to say, PR folks. It's, it's To lump, lump them all together is a big problem. Hey, you just call saying, them folks. That's the, uh, <laughs> one of the nicer uh, words you could choose to follow the word PR. Yeah, I, I'm actually doing you folks a favor saying folks. Um, but in, <laughs> yeah. in, in the Wikipedia culture, it's those PR idiots, uh, evil one, evil doer, flax. whatever you want to say, flax. Um, <laughs> yeah. So that was kind of the accepted uh, culture in English Wikipedia is that, you know, it's almost like yeah. shoot on site and do not allow to come back in English Wikipedia. And so that was kind of the pervasive mm -hmm. culture. And it's almost like we didn't want to deal with that. So we just said, no, no, no. And the problem will either go away or I'll whack you with a big stick. And what was so interesting about mm -hmm. the session that Bill, you know, tried to organize was a roundtable of Wikipedia editors and these major PR companies. And when I first heard of it and Bill invited me to come along, I was quite skeptical. You know, I was definitely open. I, I have friends who are PR people, you know, the famous line. Uh, I have worked with PR folks in the past and I said, well, it doesn't hurt to get around the table. I want to see what we can benefit from in terms of having a conversation. And what was fascinating to me was the folks that were assembled at this Donovan House meeting were not just folks who were you know, experts on Twitter and Facebook, and they knew a little bit about Wikipedia. And that was always our fear as Wikipedia editors, that the people engaging Wikipedia from the large firms were so uh, ignorant of Wikipedia's practices and norms that they were just fumbling in Wikipedia. And it's a good thing we kept these folks out all these years. The folks that were coming there from, you know, Burson, Marsteller, and the top PR firms all really understood Wikipedia's culture. And they also respected Wikipedia's position as a nonprofit source of knowledge and ranked in the top five most visited websites in the entire world. And they were quoting, mm -hmm. you know, policy. They were using acronyms like you would use at, you know, insider Wikipedia conferences and everything. So they were fully understanding what was going on in Wikipedia and were trying to engage, yet English Wikipedia had this culture of not even allowing these people to enter the gate of engagement, right? So what was really interesting right. about this, this conference was that there was suddenly a, a real face-to-face -face understanding of what PR companies were and were not doing, and that so many of these PR companies agreed to this statement saying, we are going to take a hands-off approach, at least in English Wikipedia. Uh, we are not going to edit articles directly, and we'll engage in talk pages, and we will endeavor to make sure our employees abide by these principles. And I think that was a huge first step. And as Bill said, it was mainly a reaction to a rogue boutique PR firm last year that was caught red-handed creating fake accounts, putting freelance jobs on Elance and other portals saying, we're looking for Wikipedia editors, but shh, we don't want you to 
we don't want you to tell you who we are. We don't want you to disclose what you're doing. We want you to create fake news to support what you're doing in editing. I mean, that was just horrible for the PR industry yeah. to the point where I think that these PR folks who think of themselves, you know, as trying to engage ethically all came out and said, we've got to try to set a bar for ourselves to make sure we're not lumped in with those boutique firms who are breaking the rules and doing all the stuff under the radar. So I think um, that was the, that's the context for this whole um, emergence of a statement from the PR companies. And, you know, Bill's been a huge, uh, in, uh, I would say, facilitator of this process as being able to bring together Wikipedia editors and the PR firms in a way that we've never really had before. Is that a not really capsule summary, but a brief summary of what we've we've done. So that far. that'll do. I I I appreciate you putting it that way. I mean, but you're right, though. It really has been an initiative that I've been spearheading for. Really started. It was sometime after that scandal you mentioned. I started reaching out to people, saying, you know, hey, what if I put this put up people in the same room and what if we had a conversation about this topic because it mattered to the you know PR industry. It was getting raked over the coals and. Ever, you know, apologizing for a, a company they barely knew anything about um, and practices that some of them may or may not have. You know, really, in my experience, a lot of PR companies are just like, stay away, stay away, you don't want trouble. But then you just know somebody back at the office is going ahead and making direct edits anyway. It's just it's a terrible situation that it needs, this conversation needs to happen out in the open. And that was the meeting that we had at the Donovan House Hotel here in February, led to this statement, which... As of recording now, there are 35 agencies, uh, PR agencies, including um, all or nearly all of the top 10 U.S.-based agencies signed to it, saying, hey, you know, we haven't always understood how you work, Wikipedia, but we, we're here to learn. We're, we want to give good advice to our clients and to our colleagues. And, you know, like we got a lot of good attention for that. Uh, if you go look for a Wikipedia statements, you know, PR you find a lot of good coverage from, from June. Really, though, this is just one step among many, and the latest step, actually, was this week when I published an ebook, uh, which is now available on the interwebs for downloading. It's free. It's called uh, Wikipedia and the Communications Professional, a manual. You know, n not just this... It's good, or, it's good that the agencies have said they want to do well, but the truth of the matter is Wikipedia remains very complex, most have no idea where to begin. This ebook, which is about 20 pages, and I hope it's fairly accessible, that was my intention, um, and written with feedback from folks like Andrew and many other people on both the Wikipedia and PR sides of the coin, um, it's, it really is still just a starting point for you know, getting your feet planted and oriented properly on Wikipedia if you are a marketer or a public relations specialist. And you know, this is trying to educate the community, the, the industry. It's the first of its, it's not the first of its kind. It, there's, there have been, there's been at least one other uh, kind of ebook intended for the industry, but this one's more, more detailed. Right. And I, I'll be coming back to revise it and expand it later on for a certain. Right. The, the Charter Institute so, of Public Relations in the UK was a pioneer it. in putting out some guidelines, but... But this uh, manual that, that Bill's put out is much more comprehensive. It goes into much more detail. But at least the, right. um, the CIPR in the UK started off as the most significant PR industry group that basically said, you know, don't engage in the dark arts when you're editing or when you're engaging Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. Like, don't create fake accounts and try to edit under the radar. It's inevitably going to be a, a, a much worse payback for you later on when you're discovered, right? So yeah. I think this is um, a huge first step. It'd be interesting to see where it goes from here. And if you watch the whole session that we had at Wikimania, one of the more interesting arguments from Christoph Henner, who was our third panelist there, talking about the French Wikipedia, yeah. which I thought was very compelling, even though I'm not sure I am ready to buy it hook, line, and sinker, and I'm sure the English Wikipedia is not. But he made the argument about mm -hmm. Orange Telecom, you know, which is one of the biggest telecom companies in, in France, who, who they've actually had successfully edited content in Wikipedia, basically saying, you know, if Wikipedia is the encyclopedia that anyone can edit, it should mean it. And Orange Telecom isn't anyone. And if they're willing to abide by the guidelines of Wikipedia in terms of conflict of interest and its neutrality, then why shouldn't they be allowed to edit? And it's hard to argue against mm -hmm. that 
set by saying if you're a paid editor, you automatically get excluded and you are not even eligible to be engaged in the policies of Wikipedia with his argument. Um, again, I'm not sure English language Wikipedia is ready to engage in something like that, but to see so many other European right. languages embrace that approach is quite interesting and quite eye-opening for folks who've never really looked at that side of things. Yeah, it's a cultural difference for certain. Uh, the right. French Wikipedia, the, the German, and the Swedish are the ones we know of, and um, those are the ones that have just worked it out. Look, I'm, I'm with you on this. I actually, uh, I, I, you know, if you go back a couple of years, there were limited occasions where I would make direct edits on behalf of clients, and I haven't done that since 2012. There's a whole, you know, the conversation evolved. And this day and age, uh, I actually quite like this situation. I, I, as a PR person, I don't trust PR people. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think that there's good for there to be a check. Uh, you know, Wikipedia, I think there's not enough checks in Wikipedia articles across all topics. Right. And sure, it's a matter of frustration when if you are a conscientious company representative, you know, you don't edit that page. Meanwhile, your, you know, unpaid critics or your critics who I'm sure they're paid by somebody, you know, right. your critics and your, uh, say, less scrupulous competitors are not following the same, the same protocol, this is a situation that has got to have some sort of uh, long-term change, but it's not going to happen too quickly. I have no illusion that the conversation that we had at Wikimania or the roundtable or this ebook or the statement are going to change things too quickly, but I do hope that over time we do start to change the culture and the conversation around this topic. And hey, this blogging heads conversation is part of that as well, hopefully. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a great case of, you know, any group is judged by the worst of them, right? And it happens for yes. PR folks. It ha especially happens for journalists. Um, you know, journalism yep. is, all, or the media is always put down the lowest levels, you know, next to, uh, you know, murders and folks who <laughs> do terrible things. But, the, you know, the funny thing, <laughs> right. I always look at the three, you know, professions <laughs> that tend to have, you know, especially in academia, like the three kind of clinical professions, mm -hmm. Um, are like doctors, lawyers, and journalists, right? And they all get mm -hmm. bad raps in, in one way or another, right? The, the quack doctor who did bad surgery and runs off, or the lawyer who is an ambulance chaser, or there's frivolous lawsuits. But the thing that rehabilitates mm -hmm. those two fields is that, that individuals have a personal connection to either a doctor who healed them, so therefore that image is rehabilitated, right? Like there's a doctor I saw and he fixed my broken arm or made my kid feel better. Or there's a lawyer that helped mm -hmm. get your uncle out of trouble and the, you know you have a personal connection to those two fields. Very few people have a personal connection to a PR practitioner or a journalist. So therefore their image is stuck in the mud because they're never really personally connected to citizens yeah. to rehabilitate that image to be, oh, that, that person of that profession was personally useful to me. You can say that, yes, about a doctor and a lawyer, but not necessarily about a journalist or a PR practitioner. Therefore, um, the reputation of those fields mm -hmm. tends to be stuck way down the scale, right? That's just the unfortunate reality of it all. Sure. And hey, most people don't know Wikipedia editors either, so <laughs> That's right. I, don't, I don't know what that actually says. But the Wikipedia editor um, tends, hey, to, uh, get, tends yeah. to get really good, pretty good, no, I think fairly good reputational uh, advantage, so I think... Wikipedia editors. This when is you fair say, enough. When you say you're a Wikipedia editor, I think most people kind of, uh, you know, sit their back straight and go, "Oh, that's great! You contributed and helped me in the past." So I think they tend to still have a good reputation. I think. Yeah, certainly they are nerds, and indeed, I'll verify, you know, us included, Wikipedia editors tend to be nerds. Right. Um, but you know, ner nerds can do some good things. <laughs> Uh, it seems like a good spot to leave it, I think. Andrew, thanks very much for this conversation. Uh, we'll have to do it again soon. Always a pleasure. Thanks. Thanks.